good morning. I confess, I think, um, not sure I'm quite on the same page as Nigel this morning. I caught five minutes of this morning on ITV this week when they were talking about the fact that we are in Advent and that the church marked last Sunday as Advent Sunday. That's great, but I became reverent irritated of Reigate when they leapt to the conclusion that it was okay for us to go all Christmassy. Christmas is here. The church has told us they're celebrating Advent Sunday. It's not Christmas. <laughs> it's Advent, people. Bar humbug. Our readings in Advent are all about getting ready. They're about preparations. They're not about the big event itself. Repent, for the kingdom of God has come near, shouts John in the wilderness. His sole purpose in life is to prepare people for the coming king to call them to look at their lives and to get ready to receive Jesus. We have this reading now because Advent is a time of waiting and preparation. The wilderness isn't really a natural place to go when you're preparing for a coronation. It would be incongruous if in the next five or six months, the whole focus of our country preparing to crown King Charles would be to go out into the woods and the wilderness to look for people wearing clothes that they've got from wherever they are, to be dunked in a cold river by a man wearing animal skins and eating what he can forage. That would be a bit weird, wouldn't it? So what's all this about? What's the challenge? What's the encouragement for us today as we look at John the Baptist? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are a joyful God. We thank you that when we look at you, you smile. You don't frown. You love to see us come into your presence. You welcome us as a father who's delighted to see his children. And so I pray that as we look at your word today, we would feel your smile, but we would know that we are safe with you to be honest about ourselves as well. Would you speak, we pray. Amen. There are four things that struck me about uh, this passage today. The desert, the challenge, the evidence seen in our lives, and the good news of Jesus. So I thought, excuse the sniff, sorry, I'm supposed to turn away as I sniff. Let me turn away. The desert, it's not really, it's sort of a desert, but it's certainly a wilderness. And the setting for our reading today is the wilderness. It's a place of emptiness and a place of simplicity. It's a very uncompromising space. There are no distractions in the desert. The wilderness is a place that puts everyone on the same level. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor after a few days in the desert. Once the resources you can carry have run out, there is just you and the weather. To be deserted, when we use it as a verb, means to be left, to be alone, to be without whatever you previously had. And to be deserted is not a good thing generally to be. It's uncomfortable and it's often painful. Jesus was deserted by his followers when he faced the cross alone. 
And yet it was from that place that came the action that brings us life and hope. And in the desert where John was living came this amazing message and a call to change for the people of his time. The people who maybe felt that they had been deserted by God. Abandoned by him. It had been hundreds of years since the last prophets had brought God's word to his people. So they were already in a spiritual wilderness, whether they realized it or not. And perhaps John's presence in the desert, in the wilderness was a word that spoke powerfully before he even opened his mouth. That was the place to go to hear God's voice. I wonder whether you've ever felt like you're in a bit of a desert or a wilderness. When the things we rely on or take for granted are stripped away by other people or by circumstances, by ill health, redundancy, relationship breakdown, self-doubt, bereavement, pandemic. It can feel as if the ground beneath our feet has shifted. But today we see that these places can be the seedbed for hope. The places where the distractions vanish and where we can actually face the reality of our own mortality and weakness, and where we can hear again quite clearly without all that background hubbub, God's powerful offer of life and hope as his kingdom comes near. To be in the wilderness and waiting as John was, looking for signs of the kingdom hones our focus and our character. I've just started reading uh, an autobiography of Ray Mears. Ray and I spent a lot of time together in the sixth form over at Rygate Grammar because we did the same subjects and we were in all the same sets. And so it's been really interesting to see his love of wilderness places, his awareness of the resources that are already there wherever he finds himself in the world, his desire to listen, to really listen in the silence, to see what is there for our use and for our blessing. I'm not sure he puts it quite like that. Keep praying. Our focus and our character can be honed as we wait in the wilderness. So this Advent, I'm trying to make time to wait rather than being totally distracted by the shiny pretty things, the glitter and tinsel of Christmas, which isn't here yet. We can do this in really simple ways, deciding to spend even a few minutes a day in quietness or reading a book, listening to a podcast, walking and praying. All of those things can help us to stand back and to reflect on the busyness of our lives and to wonder where the kingdom is near. If you haven't found a way yet to mark Advent, it's not too late. You can start today. There's something, um, those songs that we sang, we have sung, strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord and abide with me. Waiting requires a bit of stopping and a bit of space. So that's the desert or the wilderness. Then we've got the challenge. John probably didn't pop into town to replenish the basic necessities of life. He found them, like Ray Mears, where he was. Animal skins for clothes, foraged foods, water from the river. He had no status symbols. All he had was the role God had given him from before his birth. He was compelled to preach, not to gain followers and a reputation, but to challenge people's faith and their complacency. Basically, 
John the Baptist was saying, you've got it all wrong, folks, and you need to change. It's not a message that tends to win friends and influence people, but it is one that saves lives. I wondered why people listened to him. And I think perhaps there was something about John, about his uncompromising authenticity, that was both attractive and challenging to the people who came out to him. In the desert where everything is stripped away, everyone is equal. I haven't watched it this year, but it's the principle behind I'm a celebrity, get me out of here, isn't it? All these famous people are taken away from their wealth their public position, their support structures, families, and resources. It doesn't matter whether you can sing or kick a ball or argue a case when you're in the jungle. They're dressed the same, sleep in the same beds or hammocks or whatever it is they sleep in. They eat the same food together, if you can call it food. They face the same horrible bugs and challenges as everyone else. And what becomes evident is who they are. Matt Hancock said that was why he wanted to go in. Whatever you think of that decision, he said he wanted a chance to show who he was and what mattered to him as a person. I really admire authentic people. I would love to get to the end of my life and to be known as someone who was authentic and had integrity. Someone who always lived in a way that was true to what I believe and profess. I confess that it's a challenge. Mum, you can't say that or do that. You're a vicar. Has been heard in my house too often for comfort. But at least I'm real. John the Baptist challenged people by his words and by his life to repent, to come back to God, aware of and admitting to their faults and failures. He held up for them a vision of the kingdom to which they could belong, not a comforting mirror of their shabby lives, saying, it's okay, you're doing all right, but the promise of a king on his way to restore his people, to lead them in rebellion against the injustices and hypocrisy of the earthly rulers and warped religious authorities. This king would bring justice and judgment and they had better be ready. John told them exactly where they stood, and he challenged them to choose life. He was uncompromisingly and uncomfortably truthful. And because of this, many of the people who held power, whether religious or political, hated him. He lost his life in the end because he told Herod that killing his brother and taking his wife was wrong. John wasn't afraid of losing anything because he wasn't motivated by gaining anything except God's approval. So what's the challenge for us? I think it's the universal challenge that we find here today. Repent. Take a long, hard look at your life and how it fits in with the priorities and patterns of the kingdom of God. And be prepared to change when you find things that don't match up. Now, for some people, that's a message that they are ready and eager to hear because they know they've come to the end of their own resources. Or they're already aware of terrible mistakes they've made. And so the offer of a new path, a new hope, a fresh start is really attractive. And they leap into life. I have a friend who made the decision to follow Jesus and said, I jumped so hard into his arms, I think he probably would have fallen over backwards. It's always a joy to hear when people respond to the good news of Jesus in this way. But for most of us, perhaps it's a bit less clear cut. The Pharisees and the Sadducees had already invested much of their lives in their religious status and behavior. They thought they were doing okay. So to hear John preaching change and repentance, turning around, rethinking their beliefs and behaviors was so much harder. They were experts at justifying their own positions. 
And if I'm honest, sometimes that hardness of heart is what I see too in myself. <laughs> Sorry. To a, hang on a second. Ha, huh, hardness of heart. To admit that I'm wrong about even the smallest of things can be hard. You'd never have thought that, would you? Just have a word with Ian later. But when we do that, we build barriers. The challenge to repent, to turn around, to change, feels too big sometimes. And yet when God calls us to turn away from things that are wrong, he doesn't just ask us to turn our back on things that are sinful. He does it because as we turn away from those things, that's how we turn towards him, to find his strength, his guiding hand and his power to make any changes that we need. We may be more aware of what we'll lose by giving up a bad habit or seeking the good of others rather than ourselves, submitting to a different agenda. But in doing so, we will see the kingdom growing step by step and we will become more like Jesus. The challenge to change, to become more like Jesus, to live authentic, holy lives, isn't to be underestimated. But unless we choose to do so, we won't experience the fruitful harvest for which we long. Which brings me on to the evidence seen in our lives. Fruits mentioned twice in this passage, Speaking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, John says, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Every tree that doesn't bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. So what's the fruit of repentance? I think that it's seen in our words and our actions. John was frustrated that the religious leaders had come out to him to see what was going on but he wasn't convinced that they were ready to change anything in their behavior or in their treatment of those for whom they held responsibility. Calling them a brood of vipers was a bit of a clue that he wasn't impressed. Our feet can take us to where our hearts won't go. Being in the right place doesn't mean that we're right with God. You know that feeling when you're saying one thing, but inside you're thinking or feeling something completely different? Oh, it doesn't matter. No, I don't mind at all. Yes, I do. Why did you do that? I'm sorry I said that. I'm sorry I did that. But in your heart, you're saying, I know I'm right. And I do the same thing again. I think that John was frustrated with the hypocrisy that he saw in some of those who should have known better, and he wasn't afraid to challenge them. When we think of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, they're all positive attributes and nobody would have a word to say against them. They're the characteristics that we hope to see growing and demonstrated in our lives together as a community and in the wider world as we interact with others. They're almost like the side effects. But I wonder if we recognize them as a priority and the main evidence actually of our faith, rather than the byproduct, whether anything would change in our behavior towards friends, colleagues, strangers we meet during our day. The presence or absence of those fruits shows the state of our hearts and minds. You can't force fruit to grow, but you can cultivate the right conditions for it. And fruit needs to be fresh. We had an apple tree in our garden that when we moved in gave us good fruit. But as it got older and the fruit began to fail, we got rid of it. Not a perfect illustration but a reminder that the decision to live fruitful lives is not a one-off, but a constant choice. It wasn't enough for the people who came out to John in the desert to say, 
Our ancestors were God's people. We've always been fruit trees. We've always had good fruit. They had to live as God's people there and then if they wanted to see the kingdom come and to know their place within it. And then we get on to the good news of Jesus. Always a great place to land. After me, says John, comes one who's more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand and he'll clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. This isn't gentle Jesus, meek and mild, that John is heralding. This is the Messiah, the saviour of Israel, who's coming to sort out their destiny, to dispose of everything that's in opposition to him and to them, and to bring them back into a place of safety and victory. It's good news for people who've been feeling as though they've been forgotten, who've been overrun and oppressed by foreign rulers and powers who've taken their land and subjugated them, a people with a history of enslavement and release, of rescue, who've been given a promised land that they remember and yearn for. This saviour is a powerful figure, a mighty ruler coming with holiness and fire with purity and judgment. It's worth being on the right side in this final showdown. No one wants to be the chaff that's heading for destruction. They all want to be the wheat that's being gathered in. This is big stuff. It's serious judgment and salvation that John's talking about. John has baptised people with water. If you look for an image of John the Baptist, you'll always find him standing, well, unless it's his head on a platter, which comes up quite a lot, you will generally find John standing by a river. He was the baptizer, the dunker. People came to him because they wanted to be baptized. It was a symbolic action for those who were dunked. They weren't forced to do it. They submitted, they made themselves vulnerable and trusted that not only would they be pushed down into the depths under the water, but also that they would rise up again out of the water, ready to start again as they put a measure of trust in John. So if you went to this great hairy bloke in the desert wearing camel skins, who ate locusts and stuff, and you said to him, yeah, push me under the water, I think I'd be a little bit worried about what he was going to do next, but they trusted him and they allowed him to have that power, to have that moment of baptising them and bringing them out into clean, fresh life. Now, says John, the Messiah's coming. He's not going to baptise you by pushing you into water and bringing you out again. He's going to completely cover you, fill you, immerse you in the Holy Spirit and fire. As they chose to relinquish their physical control to John in that baptism of water, so they would be able to relinquish their whole lives, placing them into Jesus' hands and under his rule, to be reborn into the eternal kingdom where everything less than perfect in their lives would be burnt away leaving them holy and complete. Some commentators have wondered whether Jesus and his ministry were exactly what John was expecting. The prophetic imagery he uses of the king coming, making straight paths for him, the faithful lining the route for the Messiah coming into Jerusalem in triumphant return, don't quite fit with the humility and self-sacrificing love shown by Jesus. Whatever the style of the Saviour, though, the message John brings still stands. God has not forgotten his people or his promise. They will be restored, and with them all those who are willing to repent 
to be washed through baptism, to die to their old selves and to rise as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven has come near. So today, this second Sunday of Advent, is a day to acknowledge that perhaps the desert places, the places in our lives that we might try and avoid and run away from, may be the best places to start with God rather than the places to avoid. Those times when the things that we trust in and rely on are stripped away. When we think, I just want to get through this and for it to be over. Those, dare I say it, may be the best places to wait for God. To know that Jesus comes to stay with us, to abide with us. Those are the places where we grow, where we are honed and refined. Today is a day to accept the challenge, to ask, how am I doing in my walk with God? And to hear what he would say to me. Today is a day to resolve to live with authentic holiness. Making a life in which the fruit can grow. Fruit of repentance, where we let go of the things that we should let go of. And fruit of joy and hope and love and peace and service as we pick up the things that God would give us. Relying on the Holy Spirit to guide us and empower us. And it's a day as we look towards Christmas as well to look to Jesus, our Saviour, our ruler and our King with hope, with real hope for the future in his hands.